It seemed like the best option at the time. In my defense, I wasn't exactly thinking clearly. Neither did I have much time to consider other alternatives. It was either lose the hand or suffer some fate so horrible that the loss of a hand seems almost trivial by comparison. The events leading up to my self-severance are, as you can expect, rather terrible. Why else would someone mutilate themselves? I was with friends, hanging out at what I guess you can call an abandoned building, or yet to be finished one, depending on how you looked at it. It was some sort of dormitory or loft, something smaller than an apartment, and from the sign that had been out in front, meant for a classier standard of living than other housing in the area. The project had been started a year prior to the trespassing, which led to my dismemberment, and then abandoned a few months in. Apparently, some girl and her boyfriend had ventured there one night to hook up, and an unsecured beam above them had fallen, impaling them both. They were found like that, speared through their chests, embraced in wide-eyed shock at the disruption of their amorous activity. You'd think this incident of extreme mortal misfortune would deter others from trespassing on the property, if not already deterred by the various signs which threatened fines and arrests. Well, if that were the case, I wouldn't be here, telling you about how I had to cut off my hand with a box cutter, would I? My friends and I would often sneak onto the property, unwatched as it were, and hang out beneath its barely finished skeleton, chatting, drinking, planning out our nights, which inevitably found us exploring some other property we probably shouldn't have been at. In our defense, the city, the contractor, or whomever was in charge of the place should have just torn it all down. We were a small town, underdeveloped, with nothing but the internet to hold the attention of our youth. What were they expecting? The site had become a veritable town attraction for us teenagers. Stay a while at the unfinished loft, where the lovers met their end. Are you brave enough to lie at the same spot where the wood pierced their chests? In a rather unusual turn of events for my particular friend group, the abandoned slash unfinished building became the final destination of our night's rounds. We had visited several fast food restaurants, buying the cheapest snacks at each, only as justification to linger and flirt with the cute cashiers. My older brother, Nate, who was 19, but could pass for 21 if you hadn't asked him to talk, had bought us some beer from the gas station a bit out of town. There, a place often frequented by truckers, was the preferred spot of booze acquisition for us teens, because the seemingly sole attendant was what you'd call a profiteer. That is, he accepted tips, bribes, cash on top, whatever you want to call it. Five bucks in addition to the price of whatever you bought. Bellies full and beer in hand, we offloaded ourselves from my friend's Austin's truck and settled into the overly ventilated husk of that accursed building. It was, at least meant to be, fairly spacious. Several rooms had been planned, the dimensions either established by the still-standing woodwork or marked in some way on the concrete flooring. Sheets of plastic stapled to window frames or between columns were presumably meant to spare the interior from the elements. All the workmen's tools had been collected, although you could occasionally find a nail or two on the floor, as if they sprang up from between the unsealed cracks or fell from the structure. There were four of us there that night. Myself, Austin, Luke, and Ronnie. My brother, after getting us the booze, went back home to rest. Despite having bought alcohol for minors, he was still somewhat of a responsible adult and had to work the following morning. I'm glad for that, because had he been with us, he would have most likely died along with my friends. Yes, I was the only survivor of that awful night. We spent the first half hour goofing around, talking about our lives, drinking, treating the haphazard construction as if it were a jungle gym, really pushing the bacterial resistance imparted to us by our tetanus shots. When that became boring, well, when we became drunk enough for such behavior to be far too perilous, we sat on the bare concrete and fired up some music. The building was in a conveniently desolate location, the general idea of planning being that businesses would arise around it once it was finished, or 
That's what we all had guessed, at least. Regardless of the reason, we could play our music as loud as we wanted and laugh and shout and make fools of ourselves despite the time. Luke, the funniest member of our gang, was doing imitations of teachers. We were teenagers, you must remember, while Ronnie and I egged him on, in typical improv fashion. Austin, our ever-paranoid de facto guard, kept half his attention on us and the other half on his truck. He wasn't afraid of it being discovered by patrolling authorities, but being tampered with by skulking vagabonds, or what he called, degenerates. Due to the relative vacancy of the area compared to others of our town, people of sordid habits were often spotted hanging around here, although none of them ever went to that particular property with it being so open to view. Their activities required a much greater degree of concealment. At some point, I had to go to the bathroom, which only meant stepping outside of immediate view and relieving myself in what I'll call a pit. Its original purpose totally unidentifiable. Moments later, I was making my way back to the room where we were hanging out, when I decided to check out the spot where the two people had died a few months back. To my disappointment, the spot was unremarkable, having nothing to indicate that anyone had perished there. It's morbid to want some sort of excitement from that, I know, but I was a dumb, thrill-seeking kid. I self-prescribed the challenge and lay down at the spot beneath the half-constructed ceiling from which the lethally loose beam had fallen. The sky, plainly visible through the large square where the roofing would have eventually been put up, yawned on starlessly, coming across as both relaxing and ominously unnerving. The moon shone overhead, eerily spotlighting my position. I laid there for about 45 seconds, waiting, though not really expecting for something to happen. I got up and left the room, hoping that the guys had found something of interest to do, or at least talk about. When I entered and sat down as Luke and Ronnie were discussing about girls they found attractive, both being what you'd politely call eccentric, were discussing fictional women those of video games and anime. I was about to join in and offer the definitive best girl from each medium of entertainment when Austin suddenly spoke up. Dude, doesn't that hurt? I turned to him and then to Ronnie and Luke, assuming he had been referring to one of them. But they both looked at me, their eyes venturing to my left. Turning, I saw a splinter a pretty large one had been embedded into the wrist of my left arm at some point. I didn't remember it being there before, and hadn't felt anything which would have signified its insertion. The only guess that came to mind was that I'd unwittingly picked it up when lying on the floor in the death room. With genuine surprise, I remarked that I hadn't noticed it, and plucked it out quickly. Luke immediately suggested that I was lying, that I had noticed it, or I had even put it there and wanted to appear badass. Ronnie chimed in with a similar accusation, and I stuttered out a denial to their claims. Austin was the only one who hadn't viewed the situation as humorous, and looked at the splinter as if it was some extremely inimical thing. I plucked the splint. I plucked the splinter. I plucked the splinter from my wrist and flicked it at Luke, who graciously dodged it, falling into Ronnie as he did so. You're right. Want to grab some antiseptic or something? Austin's voice was oddly serious, at least in comparison to our buzz slurring and casual demeanors. Even though the hangout had grown a bit boring, I didn't want the party to disband just because of a splinter, and even if the threat of infection seemed rather likely, considering its inordinate size, I dismissed his offer, and he nodded in response and turned away, resuming his position as our sentinel. The night went on, and a strange feeling gradually overcame me. It first began as a sensation of warmth, as you can expect, was first localized in my lower left arm. As the minutes ticked by, and the constitution of my blood became greater parts alcohol, I started feeling truly sick. I'd initially attributed the warmth to the beer, but as time progressed, 
it became discernibly clear that it was a different kind of warmth. A hotter, heavier warmth, as if my blood had become molten, as if the air in my lungs had been replaced by the coarse spewed gases of some deep earth mine. My friends had apparently noticed the shift in my composure, despite my attempts to appear well. Luke, taking a breath from his humour, asked if I was alright, and if I wanted to call his mom, who was an RN. Again, not wanting to spoil the night, despite feeling like absolute garbage, I dismissed the idea, and pantomimed dialing a phone with my left hand. I'll call your mom, but it won't be about the splinter. As I've stated already, we were teenagers. My delivery was rather sluggish, and elicited only an unsteady laugh from Luke and Ronnie. Austin, not needing to be told something twice, hadn't bothered checking on me a second time, although I could tell by the tilt of his head that he was at least partially observant of my state. Cameron, is that you? The voice not only cut short the meek laughter, but also seemed to silence the ambience of the night. I first looked at Luke, expecting to see him holding a phone, but his hands were flat on the concrete as he leaned back on them. Ronnie was twiddling a bottle cap, and Austin had folded his arms across his chest. The voice spoke again, coming from my hand, still held to my ear in the imitation of a phone. Cameron, what's wrong, hun? Where's Luke? I felt ill, and not just from the effects of the splinter, but from the wrongness, the impossibility of what was happening. No one asked how I was doing it, or told me to knock it off. It was undeniable that we heard the voice of Luke's mother, speaking aloud through my hand. We sat there, staring at it. Even I did, as if it was something which shouldn't have been attached to my arm. Mom, is that you? Luke's voice came out softly, as if he had regressed several years in age. Yes, honey, are you doing all right? How late will you be out? Luke's mother said, completely oblivious to the manner in which we were communicating. Dumbfounded, not knowing what else to do, I outstretched my hand to Luke, still in that gesture which mimicked the rough structure of a phone. He leaned in, warily eyeing my hand, and spoke. I'm all right, Mom. Just hanging out with the guys. I'll be home in a bit. His mother said okay, told him to be safe, and that there would be a plate of spaghetti waiting for him in the microwave. I pulled my hand back, and in a moment of pre-natural instinct, balled it into a fist, and, as I had dimly suspected, the call was ended. There was a faint click, signifying the end of the connection. We sat, silently, staring at my hand for what felt like an hour, but what realistically could have been only a few moments. Everyone had heard the call, and being the seasoned, underage drinkers, we knew that it could not have been the alcohol playing some collective trick in our minds. It was no shared hallucination brought on by lingering paint fumes or some residual dust. We just had a conversation with Luke's mom through my hand. Dude, what the hell was that? Ronnie exclaimed. We all in turn expressed similar sentiments of confusion, and I distanced my hand from myself as if it were gangrenous. The warmth which had swelled within me had subsided during the call, and the hand felt no different than any other part of my body. At first, I'm sure we had all felt but would never admit to, what was essentially fear. But this quickly transformed into curiosity, a desire to test the limits of my newly acquired communicative powers. But first, Luke and Ronnie had of course tried to use their own hands to place calls, neither which had any success. Austin hadn't bothered trying and proffered the suggestion that my ability to do so was directly tied to the splinter which had lodged itself in the same arm. This explanation, as ridiculous as it seemed, was the only one we had. 
and so we accepted it as the reason. The first test, suggested by Luke, was to call his phone, which he retrieved from his pocket and placed on the floor, as if it was some totem awaiting magical enchantment. I again performed the gesture, but stopped short, ignorant as to how I would actually dial. Ronnie said that maybe it was just mental, that all I had to do was say or think the name of the person, since that's what I had done with Luke's mom. I tried this, thinking of Luke's phone, or rather his phone number. And sure enough, his phone started ringing as soon as I put my hand to my ear. We tried this with everyone's phone, including mine, and each time I was able to supernaturally connect with the devices. The number listed across the screens was unavailable. Attempts to call the number back were totally unsuccessful. But eventually, someone did call my hand. The call came as I was preparing to dial beyond our group, namely my brother, probably fast asleep by then. I had just brought the hand to my ear when it vibrated. Autonomously, the sensation unfelt by the rest of my body. Coinciding with this abnormal vibration was a pain not unlike the warmth I had felt earlier. It was hot and grew hotter with every second that passed until it became an agony that banished all other sense impressions from my mind. I couldn't see, hear, taste, nor smell anything. I could only feel that white-hot, searing heat surge beneath my palms, shoot through the lengths of my fingers, radiate from my joints. Luckily, some instinct granted to me by the phenomenon compelled me to form my hand into that mimicry of a phone, and upon doing so, the heat and pain overload subsided. Not a second later, I heard a voice emit from the hand. I had answered a call. I will be built. I will not be desecrated. You will take up the task, or you will fall to ruin, just as I have. The voice was plainly inhuman, and even stranger, sounded like something not alive at all, not in the way we categorize life, but animated in some supernatural artificial way. It spoke laboriously, as if unfamiliar with the language through which it had chosen to communicate. If rocks could breathe, was what eerily came later in the night as I recounted the events. The speaker did not wait for a response, and a tingling sensation in my hand not painful at all, seemed to signify that the call had been ended by the other party. We should leave. Those were Austin's words, which at the moment sounded as if there had been some deeply profound, revelatory sermon. We all immediately arose, and I shoved my hand into my pocket, hoping no one else would call and bring about that awful pain. Ronnie, always quick on his feet, was the first to leap through the threshold of our particular room and make his way to the outer area of the lot. He had nearly reached the area designated as the front lawn when a column of wood fell over, momentarily barring his passage. Shaken but undeterred, he went to step around it, but was stopped by something which pinned the cuff of his pant leg to the ground. Looking down, he saw a nail implanted through the fabric into the concrete. Having followed him, we all saw the restraining nail and simultaneously advised him to yank it out. Each of us sensing that its appearance was in some way related to the freaky call I've received, kneeling down, Ronnie went to work dislodging the nail. I think if we'd been a bit more sober, or had just generally been more impressionable to the sinister mood of the situation, we would have urged him to pull his leg away, to rip the pant leg so that we could get out of there. But we hadn't and we waited. If only we had the sense to be more afraid. It was then that the skeletal framework of the building started to shift, transforming into a structure of such geometric complexity that I could only vaguely describe its makeup as being alien, totally unlike any building or piece of abstract art I'd ever seen. My friends were dumbstruck by the impossibly animate material and we resembled pitiful woodland creatures 
moment before being obliterated by a speeding car. Ronnie swore relentlessly and started tugging frantically at the unyielding nail. Luke, afraid to move, merely babbled on about how not right things were. Austin was quiet, from either terror or amazement. It was honestly hard to tell. As the structure took on stranger and stranger dimensions, and the sky above became occluded by the transformation, Ronnie finally removed the nail from the concrete. He rejoiced, tossed it aside, and was about to exit the diminishing entryway a few feet ahead of him, when a soft thud was somehow heard above the groaning of the wood. He froze, and despite the terror manifesting around us, we focused on our friend. He turned to us, his face twisted into an expression of both pain and confusion. In his chest, directly at the spot of his heart, was the head of the nail, the rest embedded within his flesh. He was dead before he hit the ground. The rest of us, understandably, went into full-blown panic. Luke ran deeper into the contorting building although I wasn't sure if he was even aware of doing so. His mind had programmed him to flee, regardless of the flight's direction. Austin, usually the most level-headed of us, stood petrified, his eyes darting around, as if searching for some spot of normalcy among the increasingly non-Euclidean geometry. Unseen by searching eyes, a plank, sharpened to a deadly point, shot down from the archway under which he stood, slicing him down the middle. The two sides of his body parted gruesomely, falling away to the floor and landing loudly, disgustingly. It was then that I ran. I bounded over slabs of concrete, weaved through and ducked beneath barriers and unconnecting ducts, smashed through drywall like some raging bull and tore through layer after layer of insulation. But still, despite my efforts and progress, the building shifted making any distance I traversed seem infinitesimal. Eventually, after pushing on until my lungs burned nearly as much as my hand had, I stumbled into a room which had yet to undergo the more bizarre transformations taken on by the former rooms. It was here that I found Luke, kneeled over and wheezing, his body riddled with nails. Unlike Ronnie, Luke had been spared, if you can call it that, the piercing of a vital organ. The nails seemed to have been inserted with surgical precision as to keep him debilitated, but alive. Before I could go to him and offer what help I could, my hand was again stricken with that infernal pain, and without prolonging the torture, I answered the call in the way I now knew how. You will be the builder, you will see to my completion, or he will die. The call was ended as abruptly as the last one. Luke, having heard it, groaned and murmured something unintelligible. I looked around, hoping to find something with which to cover the wounds made by the nails once I started pulling them out. But all I saw was wood, concrete, plaster and dust. And all of it, without any discernible design, shifting and expanding. I went to Luke, knelt beside him, and asked if he could stand. He grabbed me and pulled me close, but instead of pleading for my help or crying out in pain, he whispered the phrase, You have to go. While I was more than fine with leaving the structure, if I could manage to, I was not going to leave him behind, not while he still breathed. I had watched the others die, and had no intention of rescuing their bodies from whatever grimly sepulchral fate awaited them within this enigmatic building. The noise of splintering wood overhead briefly drew my attention away from my nail-peppered friend, and I saw above me a mounting pinnacle, like some magically reared spire rising to blot out the moon so as to conceal the work of devilry. This palatial growth comprised of concrete shelled wood, and from the protruded, sharpened rebar at intervals, seemed to possess a vague intelligence or life, as if it were the brain, heart, or some warped nucleus of the whole abysmal structure. It peaked at a height which towered over any other structure on the night-draped horizon, 
standing sinisterly erect over its ever-shifting kingdom. Nothing happened beyond its growth, so I turned back to Luke, hoping to somehow carry him out to safety. But in the brief lapse of my attention, Luke had somehow acquired a box cutter, presumably left behind months ago, and had slid his blade across his neck. Blood fell freely from the wound, pooling on the concrete beneath his head. He turned to me, wincing as he did so, and said that he would have eventually died anyway, and that he'd rather go out on his own terms. It was a surprisingly lucid, shockingly mature statement coming from him, and I could do nothing but accept his terms. There was no saving him. I thanked him for his friendship and got up to leave. Before I could run away, he grabbed my ankle and held out the box cutter, motioning for me to take it. I did, although I was unsure what he expected me to do with it, against the monstrosity of construction reforging itself around us. I pocketed the box cutter, thanked him again, and ran through an empty doorway into another section of the building. My story comes to an end here. In this room, the walls had uprighted themselves. Even the doorway through which I had arrived was immediately sealed after my passage. Before I could attempt to demolish one of the walls, my hand again burned and I quickly answered the call before it fried my nerves altogether. You've all been overmastered. Submit, become my builder, or be entombed within my bowels. I ended the call before he could say anything else. Unfortunately, he called again, sparking that dreadful burning. I couldn't take it, knew at that moment that he would not kill me, but we continued to call until I submitted to his desires. We were the only ones who frequented this abandoned lot these days. I knew then that it wouldn't, couldn't wait for someone else to stumble upon its grounds. Sealed in with nothing else happening beyond the searing pain in my hand, I convinced myself of what had to be done. I withdrew the box cutter from my pocket, leaned against the cold concrete floor, and began sawing my hand off at the wrist. Imagine the pain of having to sever your own hand. First, slicing through the skin and underlying tissue, then reaching the bone and having to saw, saw through that. The gushing of blood, sickeningly wet, the cognitive dissonance of inflicting such pain upon yourself, your conscious mind trying to convince your brain and body that what you're commanding them to do is for their own good. Imagine all that as best you can. And still, I'm certain it won't come close to the reality of it. The room in which I was trapped had been dark, most of the light blocked by the enclosing walls, which did not alter themselves as the rest of the structure did. I was essentially blind, save for a few slivers of moonlight that breached certain cracks on the hastily constructed ceiling. The darkness was somehow settling, the inability to see the ruin of flesh at my wrist the gathering of blood, the severed hand, not having to actually see the things, almost made them seem unreal. Until, as if to deprive me of any peace, the severed hand started glowing a hellish red, another call coming through. I blacked out then. I first regained consciousness in the street, and from what I can remember, I was covered in debris and blood. Based on that memory, I assume I escaped that confinement through sheer will, had busted through a wall which, without proper reinforcement, must have been fairly weak. I again passed out, and the next memory began in a hospital bed, its edges overcrowded by my parents, Nate, and my younger sister. A doctor stood in the background along with a nurse, both trying to push through the wall that was my family so they could attend to and question me while I was still conscious. The questions came relentlessly, despite my oblivious debilitation, and I answered them as vaguely as I could, whilst giving an officer, who entered shortly after I awoke, the information he demanded. I told them of our hangout at the construction site, and fabricated a story involving a deranged man, 
Everyone immediately assumed an addict, who assaulted us with a box cutter. I explained that he had seized me, and, for some explicable reason, had cut off my hand. I told him that I blacked out then, and must have somehow made it here. I did not give any explanation for the state of my friends, would let them discover that themselves. My story was believed, and the officer spoke into a radio and dispatched some men and paramedics to the unfinished building site. They found the bodies of my friends amidst the ordinary, recognizable husk of that would-be building. They never found my hand. Hours passed, and I was eventually left alone for a bit while my parents retrieved some things from home. During this interim, I reflected back on the events, wondering if I could have imagined any of it. But, as I recalled the terrace I had endured, remembered the vividness of those titan forms taken on by the sentient building, I knew that it all had happened. At one point, the room felt as if it were growing hotter, and then the heat seemed to spatially diminish and localize itself to my right, specifically my right hand. The part first throbbed painlessly, then a sudden pain arrived with an infernal intensity, as if I had placed it into a fiery cauldron. Instinctively, I performed a gesture, then subsequently closed my hand into a fist, answering and immediately ending the call. It was still able to make contact with me. I still get a call every once in a while. I never answer it. I've grown somewhat accustomed to the frequently occurring pain, although I doubt it'll ever be something I can comfortably tolerate. The building site has remained untouched since then, aside from heavy fencing placed around the perimeter and the occasional police car that patrols the area. These measures were undertaken shortly after the funeral of my friends, all of whom were found in the exact states that I remember them dying. I've since moved away, gone to college, and even managed to acquire a decent prosthetic thanks to a fundraiser by my town. But now the incident, as horrific as it was, has already left this town's memory, save for the officers who are tasked with ensuring that the building site is not trespassed. I think it's for the best, not having to think about it. I looked into the history of the area and found nothing that suggested that the land had once been a native burial ground or anything else which would explain the presence I encountered there. I know that in some way, the deaths of that couple all those years ago were related to the inception of the horror. I suspected that maybe their deaths, their blood, had initiated or inspired the birth or awakening of something. A thing which, for whatever reason, sought to be built upon and lay claim to that particular plot of land. Hopefully the greed or laziness of those in charge of the property lets up and the site is bulldozed and paved over. But as it stands, unfinished, unborn, it'll only grow angrier, eviler, and someone else will probably die. Or even worse, it'll find someone to willingly or unwillingly finish the project. I won't say where it's located, for the safety of those who would be curious, foolish enough to investigate it. I'll only say that somewhere in eastern Missouri is a derelict half-structure haunted by an eldritch presence. <laughs>